everybody, what's up? Old School NYC Gamer, back once again here with another video. And today we're going to be talking about one of the most all-time selling computers that's been around since August of 1982. And recently we just actually celebrated its 30th anniversary. Now you can see here, of course, it is the Commodore 64. Now, since I said before, this came out in, back in August of 1982. And believe it or not, had a lifespan up until 1994. Now, considering quite a few computers came out at that time, even near the end of its lifespan, you know, you got the Atari ST, you got the, oh, I don't know, the Amiga, and of course, tons and tons of personal computers and other products that were released by Apple, like the Macintosh, so on and so forth. This computer itself had quite a lifespan, and surprisingly, a lot of developers, you know, and publishers pushed this computer to its limits, you know, putting out, like, a ton of great games. And last time I checked, the library for the Commodore 64 exceeds over 10,000 games. Quite a few not so good, but quite a few really good ones. And, you know, I've had the fortunate chance to play quite a few of them. And... My history with the Commodore isn't exactly as rich as, say, the Atari 2600. For example, you know, the first time I saw a Commodore 64 was back, I believe, in 1980... I want to say 83, believe it or not, uh, when I was staying with my cousin out in Queens. Uh, he had a uh, neighbor who lived across the street from him, and he himself had a Commodore 64. Now back then, uh, there were he had quite a few games. I can't remember the ones. He actually remember him having Donkey Kong, uh, quite a few copy disc games back then. He actually had a whole setup. He had two 1541 drives. Um, and his monitor, he actually had a green screen monitor. It wasn't a full color monitor. So whatever we saw was in like, you know, pretty much an uh, a very uh, greenish, you know, pattern and whatnot. And believe it or not, too, uh, I happened to catch a snippet of some very uh, raunchy material at the time, and I will leave it at that. But anyway, uh, you know, it only took me up to about, believe it or not, uh, I want to say two years late, uh, two years ago, that I started getting more into the Commodore 64 after seeing quite a few YouTube videos, um, you know, from Freakin' D and, uh, wow. I mean, that's probably one of the first people that really kind of highlighted the Commodore 64 for me when I saw on YouTube. And then, of course, I started researching way more and more and wanted to get more into it. So, of course, you know, this is the one I got right here. I uh, got it off of eBay a while ago. And uh, whoever had this before actually took very good care of it because even though this is a Commodore 64, they actually did a couple modifications to it. And it's opening up right here. Now, of course, this is known as the bread bin model. There were a couple of other models that were released with different color keys. This one right here I have is the uh, dark brownish keys. Now there are, of course, uh, two different shades. You have the gray keys and you have a very light, uh, light brown keys. But everything else pretty much is the same. Everything runs the same. Uh, I will show you some of what the computer looks like here, of course. If you were looking at it here, this is right here you see the Commodore 64 image. Of course, over on the side, like I said, this is modded. I don't know exactly what this does still. I really haven't tinkered with that. But of course, if you look in the back, you have quite a bit of stuff back here. Of course, you have your uh, one of your ports here for, I believe, for the printer. And this right here is for your tape drive. And of course, you got your two inputs, one for your VGA and one for your disk drive. You got your RF and it's channel three and four. And of course, back here, this is your cartridge slot which you could also, besides putting uh, cartridges, you could put other interfaces, which I've seen recently, like a lot of people who've been modding uh, flash carts, modems, whatnot, could plug it into here. Now, uh, I'm gonna get a bit more into the Commodore 64 in a bit. Um, you know, definitely wanna talk a little bit more about Jack Tramiel and just a little of the history of the Commodore 64 itself. So, you know, let's get right into it. Before we get into the history of the Commodore 64, everybody, I wanted to talk a bit about the specs and how this computer ran. Now, for it coming out back in late 82, the basic operating system for the Commodore 64 was a basic 2.0. Now, a couple of years later, they came out with something called Geos, and if you know what I'm talking about, it was kind of a Windows kind of uh, feel to the Commodore 64. It was a lot more organized, 
a little more better. Uh, if you want to know what I'm talking about, you can definitely Google that and see what Geos looks like. Now, the CPU itself was on the MOS Technology 6510, and it ran, if you, of course, there was two versions of, you know, how it ran. If you were in NTSC, it ran at 1.023 megahertz, whereas in PAL, it also ran at a 0 0.985 megahertz. And, of course, the memory here was 64 kilobytes of RAM, hence why it's the Commodore 64, with 20 kilobytes of ROM. Now the graphics itself uh, was on a VIC-2, which ran at 320 by 200, 16 colors of course, sprites, raster, interrupt. And of course the sounds, for a lot of you who don't know, this is one of the few computers I can personally say that had some of the best uh, sounds I've heard on a computer itself. No bleeps and bloops. Um, you know, people at Commodore actually thought ahead how to make the computer sound a little better by installing the SID chip which is a sound interface device. Now, it was the uh, SID 6581, and you know, it's very self-explanatory on what it does. Now, the connectivity, of course, I showed you all the stuff in the back, and you know, of course, if you didn't know, believe it or not, this was the predecessor to the Commodore VIC-20, and then, of course, later on, we had the uh, Commodore 64C, and then later on, the Commodore 128. So when the Commodore 64 was released to the public, they had to have a ton of peripherals for the computer itself. A couple that were very integral to even make the computer work itself, and I'm going to show you a couple of those right now. First off here is the Commodore 64 data set. Now this was also with the Commodore VIC-20, but of course with the Commodore 64 this was you know, very important. Especially if you wanted to uh, play your games load your programs, save your programs, so on and so forth. And you can see right there, of course, you could save what you wanted by pressing these two buttons right here. It's a basic, uh, what they call the data set. But of course, you can see right here, it actually had a proprietary uh, input. Now, if you want to remember the ZX Spectrum, you could you know, use any basic tape recorder, but Commodore 64 wanted to make this a proprietary device. Now, even though the tapes worked, you know, sometimes they have kind of a failure. Sometimes they would work, sometimes they wouldn't. And at the times loading these games took for freaking ever. So Commodore 64 finally uh, got on the boat and put this out. And this thing is a monster, people. And I'm going to have to probably put it back in a frame. And this is, you can see right here, the Commodore 1541 disk drive. Now, like I said, this is the first one that came out for the Commodore 64. And you can see, I mean, this thing weighs at least a good 10 pounds, if not over. And just showing you the back here, you got your on and off switch. Of course, this used back then a uh, basic computer plug that you used for your desktop. And of course, the inputs here. And of course, the fuse, if it blew out, you know, you could to always replace it, no problem. Now, like I said, this thing is a freaking beast. It definitely did do its job. Uh, the one pro um, main problem was, especially if you were not computer savvy, you know, you have to bring this into a Commodore 64 specialist to fix it. Now, when it came to, you know, the media itself, you know, like I said before, they actually did come out with a smaller version of the Commodore 1541 drive. And this one right here is the Commodore 1541 2 disk drive. A little more old, uh, a little more modern, uh, definitely a lot more smaller, a lot more lightweight. Uh, you, can see, you can see right here, you got your serial, your interface, uh, specific device, and the power. Now, of course, they want to use a specific part, uh, Commodore 64 plug for this for you to, for it to make it work, which was kind of the one of the drawbacks, if you ask me. And, you know, of course, you could, you could always daisy chain it. So if you wanted to copy off certain games, certain programs, you could do that. And the disk itself, you know, it, they, they mostly work for the most part. But, of course, when it came to the Commodore 64, you know, they always had uh, ways to try to uh, improve on the computer itself. Now, of course, if you wanted this, you, know, you didn't want to wait so long for the, excuse me, the disk drive to load, you actually have something which was this. This is the fast load cartridge. Basically, you just plug this in the back of your Commodore 64, and, you know, when you're loading your disk, it would run a hell of a lot faster, for sure. And just to show you what the disk itself looks like, this is a uh, five and a quarter floppy disk as you can see right there and of course if you know if you wanted to uh, play it just do that and then of course you would type uh, do the uh, load command for it 
And there you go. So that was, you know, how you basically have certain of the games run. But when it came to the cartridges, well, like I said, even with a fast load cartridge, if you had a game cartridge like this, plug it in the back, turn it on, and it would just fire right up. So, of course, Commodore 64 had three different types of media. They definitely did try to uh, stay above or ahead of the curve, you know, when it came to some of this stuff. So, like I said, let me just uh, give you a little history of the Commodore and, you know, just talk a little bit more about it. As I said before, everybody, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Commodore 64, its history, and the person behind it. Now, when this came out back in August of 1982, this retailed for $595, and you would think that's quite a bit of money. But consider when the Apple II was out at the same time, that was priced at $1,200. So, of course, if you're going to want this for your kid, you're going to go for the computer that's $595, as long as it's a good computer, which Commodore proved down the line it's one of the best-selling computers of all time. They estimated in its lifespan that it sold between $12.5 million to 17 million units and that is quite a hell of a lot and for it being the best selling single personal computer of all time that's quite in a freaking feat if you ask me now this of course you know the Commodore 64 itself went under a few names besides being the Commodore 64 it was commonly called the C64 the CBM 64 which is short for Commodore Business Machine or the VIC-64, which funny enough, this was the predecessor to the VIC-20. With all these numbers I'm throwing at you everybody, consider this. Between 1983 to 1986, the Commodore 64 dominated the market with between 30 and 40% share and 2 million units sold per year. That's a lot of freaking computers people, and it even outsold the IBM, Apple, and Qatari computers. Now, what's really funny is when Sam Tramiel, who was uh, Jack Tramiel's son, also owned Atari down the line, even said in a 1989 interview, when I was at Commodore, we were building 400,000 C64s a month for a couple of years. Like I said before, people, do a lot of that math. It's a lot of freaking computers. Now, of course, part of its success, you know, besides it being sold in retail stores, toy stores, college, uh, bookstores, you name it. The Commodore 64 was sold in as many stores and as many retail uh, places as possible. But of course, for it being, uh, the computer being sold at $595, you want to know how much this cost just to build it, believe it or not? It cost them a whopping $135. Now, the you know, having the price so low for it to be built was they did a lot of the in-house control supplies and cost. Now think of it as the model, uh, the model T of computers, you know, and this is mostly behind Jack Tramiel's doing, you know, for it, you know, being so low to build. Now, of course, you know, this has a lot of history. Of course, the person behind it, Jack Tramiel, you know, a lot can be said about him. A lot of his business practices were very shady, kind of scrupulous. You know, he was a, you know. He could be put into a bunch of categories, some good, some bad, but no matter what, you cannot deny his place in computer history, no matter what. Now, some would think that Commodore itself, the company, came out in the 70s, but you're way wrong. This company actually was started by Jack Tramiel all the way back in 1955 when he was in Toronto. Now, of course, in 1962, he made the company public by doing typewriters and then eventually calculators. Now, of course, seeing that the technology is advancing, he definitely himself wanted to get into the computer market. Now, of course, he featured the Commodore PET back in 1977, and it definitely took off quite a bit. You know, people wanted it left and right, especially for schools. And, of course, later on, the Commodore VIC-20 came out, and then, of course, the Commodore 64, so on and so forth. But sadly, Jack Tramiel actually left the company in January of 1984, took over Atari, and, you know, that's basically what happened after that. Uh, he was one to push computer technology, definitely 
want to get it out, as he says, for the masses, not the classes. So that's about it. And yeah, people, I mean, I can't really say too much about Jack Tramiel myself. Uh, I have my own personal opinions, but I will not leave them on here because they are personal. But the one thing you cannot take away from him, he definitely did push out computers and then some to almost everybody out there on the planet Earth. Definitely was an innovator when it came to uh, technology, especially with the computers, so on and so forth. And, of course, you know, recently he passed away, you know, from natural causes. But, like I said, his legacy can be marked in many good ways and many bad ways. It's just how you yourself would perceive it as. But anyway, that's my look here at the Commodore 64, everybody. Hope you guys and gals enjoyed the insight I had on this. Definitely a computer I would pick up if you're into, uh, you know, personal computing and just want to play a lot of these games I do recommend getting it if you can find it for cheap on the internet or at a flea market in good condition I definitely would recommend it over 10,000 games uh, if you're one of those people who don't want to get it but just want to experience the games you can go on the internet you can find emulators for it like Win Vice for one and the games themselves are pretty accessible via the internet to get but Nothing beats the real thing, people. That's all I got to say. If you can get your hands on this, I definitely do recommend it. And that's about it, everybody. Thank you very much for watching. Definitely t check me out on Facebook and Twitter for more updates on what's going to be happening with me uh, when it comes to gaming and gaming. That's about it, people. Have a good one, everybody, and take care. Cheers.